Welcome to Cyber Focus from the McCrary Institute, where we explore the people and ideas shaping and defending our digital world. I'm your host, Frank Salufo, and have the opportunity to sit down today with Gavin Wild. Gavin is a senior fellow with the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. Prior to Carnegie, he served at the National Security Council, where he was director for Russia and the Caucasus and the Baltics. Prior to that, spent a decade in various national security positions in our, in our intelligence community. Gavin, thank you for joining us today. It's an honor to be here. Really privileged to have you. And obviously, you've had played a major role in a number of the big developments uh, our country is facing today. And, and I'd like to start with, you wrote a, a bit of a contrarian piece recently in uh, the Texas National Security Review, a, a great journal. Uh, Bobby Chesney and uh, good friends are, uh, are, are running that. And you sort of re-examined a little bit uh, in terms of the role and the impact countering uh, foreign influence, foreign intervention has on uh, a number of the, the challenges facing us today. And, and I'd, I'd, I'd love for you to go deep in the article, but maybe start with, back up with 2016, you also played an integral role in the intelligence assessment in terms of Russia's activity in 2016. So take us back to 2016 and then maybe how your some of your views have, have changed a little bit. Yeah, no, I've been extremely fortunate to um, have been able to work on very consequential issues related to Russia, uh, propaganda, cyber, election security, all of those types of issues over the last several years. And um, yeah, this this the genesis for this paper, I think, starts in 2016 when uh, myself and our colleagues uh, in the intelligence community were, were working on trying to tell the story not only for the president and for you know the the national security consumers of of uh, of these products that the intelligence community puts out but ultimately for the american people because the the president and and then uh director of national intelligence uh, general james clapper kind of said look first you got to get all the cards on the table and and look at what happened and then we've got to go tell the american public about it and it was in the process of working on that and, and drawing on the expertise that uh, that uh, a lot of us had and our, our backgrounds in studying Russia mm -hmm. to kind of first off level set how Russia thinks about information, how Russia thinks about uh, influence and subversion. And uh, certainly since 2016, there's been you know a, a deluge of great literature on that. But I think at the time, where I started and where I think some of my colleagues were as well was this fear that, wow, Russia's got this really uh, holistic and very um, kind of logical idea about the role of information and how humans interact with information, how propaganda works and mm -hmm. how subversion works. And their national security thinkers and their intelligence thinkers have, have put together this model and the U.S. doesn't have an analog, or at least at the time in 2016, we kind of felt the U.S. doesn't quite understand this Russian model, and it doesn't really have an analog for how to counter it. And so at the time, I think that was the, the deepest sense of urgency, uh, at mm -hmm. least for myself, was that, oh, um, we just haven't level set how to think about this problem yet. Since 2016, I think my own thinking has evolved from uh, concern about the fact that Russia has this view of information and propaganda. And now I, I think I'm equally, if not more, concerned that we in the U.S. national security apparatus have adopted a similar version of that thinking. Hmm. And I think that kind of mindset or that worldview uh, has or poses some real challenges for democracy. Uh, in and of itself. Over the past several years, I wrestled with this sense that there was something um, missing from the way we thought about disinformation, propaganda, or the Russian threat of subversion. There was something that was either missing or concerning that I couldn't quite put my, my finger on. Mm -hmm. And this paper was essentially a year-long plus process of me trying to shake those marbles out of my head and um, be as, as comprehensive as I could and kind of trying to identify what's the problem we're trying to solve and what are the pitfalls of maybe the way that we've come to approach it in the you know several years since the 2016 
you know, subversion operations. So fast forward to this article in 2024. What what were the biggest takeaways? I, I've come from the school of thought historically the 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 greatest disinfectant is transparency. But in some cases, maybe it's ignoring it altogether. But I'd be curious what uh, what some of your big takeaways are here. So I I tried to dip into kind of fields that I'm less familiar with, mm -hmm. um, sociology and media and communication studies and dabbled into a little bit of a history of how did American thinking around these things evolve. And um, so I kind of centered around two types of logic, if you will. One, the logic of democracy itself mm -hmm. and why foreign propaganda poses a threat to it. And, and for the most part, what I zeroed in on is this idea that, look, what Russia really was trying to do and uh, in 2016 was kind of undermine our our faith in these institutions and in the, in mm -hmm. the institution of democracy our faith in elections road trust it, undermine confidence exactly and and, yeah. and, and and drive more and exacerbate those so societal fissures mm -hmm. that exist in, in any um, society whatsoever um, but really particularly in the United States there that touches on issues of race that touches on issues of class um, and they played on all those themes in their influence operations in 2016 and, and since then. So that was the first kind of logic, is, is democracy and the threat that is posed to it from propaganda. But then I, there's a second logic that's certainly kind of newer in the sense of what happened in 2016 and since then, is we've got this rapidly evolving technological environment, this, this media environment that is now no longer um, as hierarchical and constrained as it was in, in previous decades, um, where we kind of had influ a limited number of influential figures, a limited number of outlets. And fewer editors. Fewer editors, <laughs> and, and folks, folks in general had fewer facts, factoids and data points to have to contend with and interpret as they do mm -hmm. nowadays. On a, mm -hmm. And comparatively, now we have an endless supply. And so underlying that, what's the logic underlying our fear in this new technological environment? And that logic that I circle around to is kind of the logic of data. This idea that by uh, having so many of your day-to-day -day activities kind of datafied mm -hmm. and available for you know any actor to kind of try to harness and accumulate and draw some inference and find some combination of words and themes to zero in on certain sections of the population and try to nudge them in one way or the other. That's the second logic that I kind of interrogated. And without really knowing where I was going to land, this was just a big research project on those two logics um, to see um, what the benefits and drawbacks were of, of trying to counter uh, or uh, trying to make foreign malign influence, as a lot of people call it, into a national security concern. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So what, what were your takeaways? Not to, to jump to the end, but uh, specifically, what were your key findings? What maybe surprised you? And what may have been different in terms of what you were thinking eight years ago vis-a-vis -vis today? So I think from a historical perspective, one of the things I I really dove in on is the fact that the conversation we're having right now involves a lot of different uh, mechanics, obviously, but it's a debate that we've been having for a long time. Mm -hmm. One of the debates or discussions, I guess you could call it rather, um, uh, dates back about a century where you had prominent journalists, prominent sociologists, uh, prominent uh, media figures really kind of trying to grapple with the idea that media has this kind of controlling relationship with the masses, that mm -hmm. you can steer the masses and uh, kind of engineer consent, as it's been called, through, through the media. Mm -hmm. And to distill the issue down a little bit, one of the debates that, you know, at the time in the 20s, Walter Lippmann and John Dewey had was this, this paradox where you're, you can't service your fears in foreign or, or even domestic media manipulation mm -hmm. without diminishing your faith in the democratic process. Servicing one of those hmm. 
in resources, in effort, in attention will necessarily come at the cost of the other. And I think that's a, that's a, a challenge democracies have and, and will continue to have, that democracies kind of rooted in this idea that you have to trust in yourself and your neighbors to come to some kind of rational conclusion about the world around them, and that in the process of doing so, you, um, the, the public decides and votes on and kind of charts its own destiny. So to unpack it maybe a different way, I, I mean, when you look back to 2016 and, and, and others who are trying to learn from those playbooks, those mistakes, those opportunities, it was mostly pouring gasoline on wedges that already existed and trying to drive that further and further apart. Do you think that that had limited impact, limited effect? What do you think it means uh, today? So the the other thing that I kind of landed on in this paper is that A, it's very hard to know, and B, it might just be unknowable. Mm -hmm. And ergo C, some of our getting wrapped around the axle might actually be counterproductive in trying to find that causal link between mm -hmm. um, subversive behavior on one side and some kinds of uh, discernible change in attitude, behavior, or belief on any given subject, be it race, be it who to vote for, and moving into you know even advertising whether mm -hmm. or not to buy a certain product. The jury is by and large still out. It's very hard to empirically prove one way or the other that were it not for X, Y behavior or belief might not have happened. But I, as, I, as I point out in the paper, that very uncertainty is itself somewhat instructive. Because if we uh, in the research community, we in governments, mm -hmm. we in academia are we in advertising mm -hmm. are no closer to being able to really dig in and find those causal links. Foreign adversaries have no better shot at it. And starting from that, that base level of limitation and reminding ourselves that um, our foreign adversaries um, have to start at that base level as well is, is reason for a little bit of uh, right-sizing the threat of foreign interference in our own minds. Not that it's not a concern, but that we ought to start from the assumption that its effects may very well be marginal, if at all, rather than where I think we've come to start from, which is the fact that I can see them attempting it means it must be having some impact. Yeah, and, and if you're looking for something, you tend to find it, right? You buy a new car, you suddenly see everyone has that uh, as that car. So I, I'd be very curious if you were advising the national security advisor today or a director of national intelligence or one of the agencies, what, what, what would you be suggesting? Are you suggesting that sometimes the reaction amplifies the problem? I think that's part of it. I think the other thing I would say is probably, um, ma'am or sir, this problem is best addressed domestically. It is not something that we will, um, uh, we will ever be able to deter our adversaries from trying to um, influence public discourse because in a democracy where there are hard limits on, on what we can do to shut down discourse irrespective of its origin, there's, there's, some, there's some degree at which this problem is not fixable uh, in terms of shutting down um, foreign voices from, from kind of informing the dialogue here, uh, but rather um, to the extent that it is having an impact, it's having an impact as part of a much broader constellation of factors, some of which have nothing to do with media, nothing mm -hmm. to do with the online space, and some of which have everything to do with everyday lived experience. One of the things I draw from in this piece is kind of a a large-scale survey that the OECD did um, over the last, uh, for in 2022, I believe it was published, of 22 democracies where they kind of asked, like, what is trust in institutions? Mm -hmm. What is trust in democracy rooted in? And it's not, the, the answers were not surprising at all. It's access to the policymaking process, perceptions of, of corruption or elite capture, um, particularly for those who are um, less educated, less affluent, um, in minority groups. Um, the, the kind of bread and butter 
uh, things that we think about as in terms of democracy every day, none of those necessarily stem from what I read and hear in the media. They interact with that, certainly. But I think um, all of that to say, I think shoring up trust in democracy, if we're starting from the, well, how is it being portrayed in the media? Or what's the role the media plays in it? We are kind of limiting ourselves and our, and our range of, of policy prescriptions. Uh, to, certainly if we're trying to use um, you know, kind of national security toolkits to mm -hmm. deal with it, I think that's self-limiting. See, this may be an awful analogy, but I grew up in an Italian family. Families bicker and fight like no other. But when someone else from the outside lobs a bomb, we all come together. And, uh, and I'd be curious. To me, it's still angering when deception is being used to be able to uh, serve as a megaphone for an idea or view. If it's another citizen, that's one thing. If it's, uh, and you may get angry over that too, but, 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 but it does just feel different. Am I, am I wrong on that? Not at all, and I think that's probably the underlying reason why, why particularly in the national security space, we had so much of a scrum to, to act and to mm -hmm. make sure this didn't happen again after 2016. Even though we didn't quite know what effect it had, we couldn't empirically prove that a lot of these um, activities changed votes one way or the other. But the point was it felt like a violation of our sovereignty. It undermined what um, political scientists call our, our sense of ontological security, this mm -hmm, idea mm -hmm. that the government and the, the institutions of the state exist to secure your social existence as much as anything else. And if, mm -hmm. if they fail at that, then that really rattles the foundation yeah. of trust yeah. Yeah. in them. So and, and trust in institutions are not at all time highs, are they? Even media for, for uh, that in, in, as one example, but also government at the federal, state, local. So, so what do you, I, I mean, the solutions seem like they're pretty, uh, difficult to, to try to get our arms around, but what would you be advising right now? Take China, who I, I think there have been a, a, a number of stories are attempting to potentially uh, dabble in our, in, in, in our elections. I think the, I would ask ourselves, um, again, back to that, that foremost question of, I think there's a real risk in starting from the assumption that China's attempts to do so are necessarily going to be impactful mm -hmm. surely by dint of trying them. Because by granting them that much of the benefit of the doubt, the thing that suffers in the aftermath is the amount of confidence we have in, in the American public. Now granted, there's never historically been, um, I think H.L. Mencken said, no one ever went broke betting against the stupidity of the American <laughs> public. but. Again, that sense of pessimism, you know, we talk a lot about, well, what if people lose faith in their institutions? Well, the ver reverse is also a risk. What if the institutions, the leaders, the policymakers, what if they lose faith no in the people? confidence in the people, yeah, yeah. And so that part, I think that's a flip side that I would advise that, yes, it's concerning, but also, yes, we need to start asking ourselves, okay, if there is some risk that some untrue narrative is going to find resonance with certain sections of the public, why would that be? Irrespective of their media diets, irrespective mm -hmm. of, of anything they're coming across online, why might a certain narrative have resonance? And let's address, let's see if we can identify that and try and address that underlying um, lack or um, problem within the American public itself. Um, because we're never going to be able to shut down Chinese leaders saying things publicly, Chinese newspaper like th th that's a an impossible hill to climb. But probably better to um, fail at the attempt of trying to address some of the um, political culture in the United States, the socioeconomic issues, et cetera, uh, than to uh, catastrophically succeed mm -hmm, mm -hmm. at trying to shut down, you know, narratives online or in the media space. And, and when I look at this, I, I, I take for granted 
sometimes democratic principles, norms, or what everyone's looking at. But autocratic regimes don't have to succeed. They have to undermine some of our own uh, some of our own principles in 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 some ways or another. Um, do you feel that we're doing too much? Or should we retitrate that? Should we recalibrate our response? Um, I, I, I think we have a responsibility to let our policymakers and our decision makers know what someone's doing in terms of their intentions. But that doesn't necessarily translate into impact, as you're sort of saying. But uh, how, how would you go about uh, uh, advising some of our policymakers on this? I think I look at what's happened on the Hill with regard to TikTok. I look at some of the efforts. We're going to pull that thread in a second. Yeah. I think I, what concerns me about trying to counter propaganda is it adopts some of the same mindset as the propagandist. The, it starts kind of introducing a little bit of conspiratorial thinking that every, every narrative has some kind of orchestration behind it. Mm -hmm. It discounts the idea of any kind of organic public sentiment or legitimate reason for holding a certain belief. Um, it provides policymakers with a bit of a whipping post excuse for some of their own failings. You've, you've seen it presently um, where folks are pointing at, well, it's fake news, it's Russia propaganda, it's China propaganda. Um, that's too simplistic a scapegoat, I think, for some of the uh, to be able to deflect from some of the accountability that we ought to be demanding from our political leaders to improve the political climate in their own behavior. And so all of those things stacked up together start to look like a pale imitation of those very autocratic regimes hmm. we're fighting against that assume um, that there's always foreign plots behind every narrative. They're very quick to try to jump on the media in particular to try to either filter out uh, problematic narratives or, or worse, try to ban certain outlets, mm -hmm. um, make investigative journalism more difficult. Like that, those types of instincts, however noble, start to take on the same hue as autocrats. And I think that's a risky gamble. So I do want to pull that thread. You, you did touch on uh, TikTok, and, and, and I, I don't see it so much as a banning, as divesting bite dances uh, uh, role in all of that when you, when you pull the thread further. And being an investigative journalist in many of these autocratic countries is the most dangerous job in the world. Uh, hopefully it is never the case here in the United States. But, but tell me uh, what you think in terms of TikTok, because I... I do think that uh, they are sharpening their algorithms in such a way that they are targeting the most important technology in the world, that between our two ears, and attempting to influence. You'll hear nothing about Uyghurs. You'll hear nothing about some of the uh, uh, issues that the Communist Party of China would prefer you not to know about. And you are amplified, whether it's the the conflict right now vis-a-vis uh, -vis Israel and, uh, and, and its war on Hamas, uh, as, lo as well as the broader issues in Gaza, as well as Russia, Ukraine. D tell me what you're thinking in terms of TikTok. Do you, do you feel people should just be smart in terms of what they're viewing, or is there a point where technology and the algorithms running it are getting so sophisticated that it's pretty hard to discern fact from fiction? I think I would probably lean more towards the former. Uh, one of the bits in my paper that I touch on is this, this logic of data and algorithms and that there's some kind of innate magic in that sauce. I think one way I would characterize this paper is that it's a bit of a, a treatise against pessimism, which we spoke about, mm -hmm. but also positivism. Mm -hmm. And by positivism, I mean this kind of idea that there exists some laws of, of information similar to physics or chemistry of how humans and in information interact. Sociologically, we know that's not the case, that it's just far more complex than that, that there's no kind of fixed form or, or there's no such thing as kind of a fully objective, you can't rule subjectivity out. And I think the way we think about data and algorithms sometimes tends, a, tends to lead us down that dark alley of, of assuming that, that humans are as malleable 
and behave in those kind of kinds of fixed ways. And so I think. But you wouldn't question that it's actually being attempted, right? Correct. I yeah, that that part I is 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 under no doubt. I have no I operate under no illusions that either China, Russia or anyone else or the United States for that matter will seek to maximize their opportunities in the digital space to 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 pursue their interests and influence uh, audiences in ways that they think are are beneficial to them. Again, I think the risk there throughout is that when we when we try to examine information as an as an essential thing or as a fundamental unit, we can't mm-hmm. help but objectify humans in the process, mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. so we and dismiss their the amount of discernment, the amount of agency and deliberation that they put into what they decide to consume, which as uh, several cognitive scientists, one in particular that I cite in the paper, Hugo Mercier, kind of wrote an entire book about how we have this false sense about how gullible we are and our neighbors are. And in fact, folks tend to be pretty discerning about the types of information they consume. And so there's a lot of research out there that to, to kind of suggest that folks are misled because they want to be misled. They, they find more substance and value socially in the types of information they consume um, because we're not wired necessarily to, to operate by accurate factual information all the time. Paradigm shifting is very hard. It's very mm-hmm. mentally mm-hmm. intensive, and it comes with social costs. And so the, the idea that folks are misled who don't, by and large, intend to be misled in the first instance um, with regard to their media diets, at, in the very least, I think uh, can easily be overstated. And, but bear with me for a second and I'm going back in time a little bit uh, looking at some of the the, the work uh, around countering Islamist sort of behavior where it, it did have this effect of reaffirming in my views aberrant attitudes if you keep getting a steady diet and and we were concerned not just about those that who could be influenced but most importantly those that may act on where maybe they already sat and it's pushing them over the edge um, to actually act up. And, and, and again, in the counterterrorism business, a little different than the countering foreign influence business, you don't need big numbers. Small numbers can, can, can cause significant harm to public safety and the like. But I think you're starting to see some of the same, if you look at fishing expeditions, they become more and more and more and more sophisticated. Uh, Initially, they were pretty rudimentary. Um, Still, a small number fell for it, and you don't need to be right all the time. That's the problem. All they need is one sucker to be on the hook, and good day for them if they blast a billion emails and and a small number are lured. But I'd be curious what your thinking is around there. The idea of not just influencing one's views, that's one set of questions, but influencing someone who may act on those views in, in ways very detrimental to, to our national interest, national security, and the like. I think it's it would be probably most constructive to think about propaganda in in that instance as part of an emergent process that's um, where it's again part of a broader constellation of factors that's that's converging um, on a person to um, help solidify a certain set of views mm-hmm. or attitudes and that ultimately culminates in some kind of behavior I think it would be very difficult as I said to try to either make the propaganda, uh, the causal, uh, mm-hmm. the actual causal link there. Um, I think it's probably a fool's errand to even try. Um, but again, all of that to say, rather than where I think we tend to go, which is is treating it as a contingent or direct factor and focusing so much energy and time and effort in trying to put a stake in, in that, mostly because it's what we can see. It's, Mm -hmm. we have the data for it. Mm -hmm. We have, you know, pools, especially now, we can look at pools of likes and shares and retweets and go, this is how beliefs are formed. Maybe, but it might also be a little bit of street light effect where we're searching simply because this is where the light is best. And uh, so I I don't discount at all that, as as you point out, that there's certainly, 
it's playing a role, maybe even a, a significant one, in how all of this comes together and culminates in aberrant behavior. Um, I would just say we should make sure to, to that we don't sweep under the rug a whole host of other relevant emergent factors uh, in the process. Mm, that's that's a very very thoughtful uh, response to all that because again, that business was a little different. It was attempting to stop small numbers of being recruited, radicalized, and acting on 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 some of those behaviors. And and I think that's where the marketing analogies fall short because you don't it doesn't matter if you get majority. It's a, it's small numbers that that make a big difference. Let me ask you in terms of what uh, was Putin sold a, a book of goods? You think uh, go back to the IRA? Uh, why are they continuing to invest in all this? Uh, so two things. A, I think Moscow has long had this very mechanistic view of human beings and of societies mm -hmm. as being kind of a machinery that can be tweaked by And when you can power. control the society to an extent, it may work in their right. own case, right? Right, because they're and set then of they circumstances. mirror image. Exactly. Yep, yep. They've got a set of circumstances where it may be a lot easier to constrain access to certain media and certain narratives. In the case of the IRA, I kind of, I would think about the IRA or the Russian troll farms in very much the same way I think about Cambridge Analytica. When people read about it, it's usually one of two concerns. One, like, holy cow, like how, how devious, mm -hmm. how devious. And the other, usually by folks that either work in, uh, you know, have, have worked behind the scenes in tech or on algorithms going, this is snake oil. Mm -hmm. um, people were outraged about Cambridge Analytica because it felt like a violation of privacy. It felt like they were being kind of spied on and, mm -hmm. and harvested and, and commoditized by, by uh, actors to achieve a certain political end. And rightfully so. That's, again, it's an affront to your kind of sense of ontological security. But then the other, uh, the other response is, these guys got paid an awful lot of money uh, <laughs> for what is essentially snake oil. And so I think, you know, certainly Yevgeny Prigozhin sold the Kremlin a bill of goods that this would somehow be a miracle of, of information operations abroad. Um, and I think... But part of that is us. We've done a measure of that work for him. And, and I know you've also done a, 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 some some writing in terms of uh, implications it has in the battlefield in Ukraine. Any any light you want to shed there? Well, I think, again, it, it goes back to that similar urge to assume that if we can datafy our environment, then we can somehow model it. And if we can model it, then we can make it predictable and we can make it digestible and that we, it will give us an advantage. And again, it's kind of that, that physics envy. Um, philosopher, the philosopher Karl Popper talks about it as a problem of clouds versus clocks. And I think about it in terms of we can datify everything there is to, to datify about a cloud to try to understand it. And all of that at the end of the day still will not make a cloud behave the same way a clock does. Hmm. And I think that's the way I think about human endeavors, whether it's their engagement with the media environment, their engagement on the battlefield or in war, that humans are just inherently complex. They are self-contradictory. They zig when we think they're going to zag. There's no universal form. They, when they hear the same word, 50 different people are going to have 50 different connotations and denotations and inferences that they could draw from it. That's an extremely hard problem to try to datify and model, and it's infinitely recursive. Mm -hmm. It's subject mm -hmm. to interpretation and semantics and semiotics. And, and so I think the, the hard part for us is not yielding to this logic that with enough data, we can somehow deconstruct the human being and make them moldable or predictable. Because again, I think at the, as a Russia nerd, that was kind of what I started to identify was the troubling theme of by trying to counter this, we can't help but somehow adopt some of those lenses that 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 Putin and and she might have. And tactically, 
vis-a-vis -vis strategically uh, and, and push back on this, please. I, I mean, I see it as sort of prepping the battlefield. It's sort of first foray in to try to weaken the will or the, uh, the, the, uh, of the adversary. It has, has, and I was a little surprised that cyber did have some effect in, uh, in, in, in battlefield applications. U.S. tends to look at cyber more as a force multiplier, how it can enhance more uh, kinetic and traditional Title X uh, uh, authorities, but didn't seem to have as big of an effect uh, in Ukraine, or has it? I think in terms of um, cyber as a, a, like you say, a force multiplier, certainly in intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance, mm -hmm. it's only going to continue to play a, a, a major role in how you know, wars are fought and certainly and in China's case too. Yeah, I think the real question mark that has been um, raised, certainly by Russia's performance in Ukraine, is the degree to which this this big strategic cumulative disruption necessarily um, lends itself to um, any kind of discernible battlefield. Um, mm -hmm application absolutely I, I like I think they talked themselves into very much into air very much in the same way we talked ourselves into air power being the next big mm -hmm. strategic mm -hmm. thing of I think um, Russia certainly thought of cyber operations disruptive cyber operations as we will grind down the enemy we'll get them to demoralize and distrust um, but in Ukraine at least it seems to have worked the exact uh, boomerang effect of the more you uh, make life hard, this is not leading them to Builds want to resolve. capitulate. Yeah, it's 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 Building causing a rally around the backbone. flag effect. Yeah, yeah, and and I guess there are two different examples. In Georgia, it might have had some impact. Maybe in Estonia, less so. Because in many ways, Estonia is the antithesis of anything Soviet. They are the opposite of anything. Uh, um, closed uh, in, in some ways, but well, and that makes a, an interesting point about resilience and adaptivity. Of mm -hmm. like, if we saw today the kinds of attacks that Estonia went through in 2007, mm -hmm. which were largely denial of service DDoS attacks, attacks, yeah, yeah. distributed, not of super services. sophisticated, relatively recoverable, bit of a pebble in your shoe, but at the time that was kind of. You know, Given they our, went all in on digital. Yeah. Right, yeah. right. The, the, the idea, that the way we securitized that attack was to think how catastrophic. And it was at the time. Mm -hmm. But we didn't really lend ourselves um, the kind of the, the benefit that, that we might become a little bit more resilient over time mm -hmm. to the point where now when you think about DDoS attacks, like it's, you know, it's kind of the, the cheap throwaway. It's, yep. It bugs yep. you, but you can get past it. And so I think um, whether it's cyber normally diversionary or, too, right, yeah, yeah. right. So it's Look important to give your certainly be mindful of the threat, but also be mindful of the resi the, the capacity for resilience as well. And, and I th and I'm glad you brought up the R word. Resilience is what we're looking at. I I can't imagine in a democratic society we'll ever be in a position to protect everything, everywhere, all the time from every perpetrator and every modality of attack. I, I don't think that's a society I'd want to live in, but uh, it, to guarantee that 100% all the time. That said, I do want to ensure as much safety and, and resilience as, as we can. So all of your work here, what does that sort of entail from a, a resilience uh, perspective? I think in terms of the era that we're living in where technology has left us with so little room to even catch up and, and catch our breath, mm -hmm. you know, in terms of how we live and work and receive information and operate everything's uh, digitally. We, we live with this ever present sense of precarity. Mm -hmm. And I think it's important to distinguish that kind of sense of disorientation from something that's being done to us by outsiders. Mm -hmm to something that's just simply happening organically mm. as being part of a, a society in the 21st century. So A, distinguishing those two phenomena that, that 
you know, that sense of precarity simply is because of the era that we're living in. And it may be very difficult for democratic trust and mm -hmm. trust in institutions But don't make it survive. a self-fulfilling prophecy. Right. right. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. it's also an opportunity, I think, to, to remember that, like, the solution for that is not uh, to be found anywhere else but here. And it, it can't be, it, we can't be av uh, avoidant or distracted from that really homegrown, um, uh, the necessity of homegrown solutions to those problems because it, it can't be, the solution won't be found in the tech, mm -hmm. the solution won't be found in um, Dirty data in, dirty, dirty data out, bad decisions <laughs> made. And, and I would be curious, the, the broader AI sets of issues, I, I, I mean, what are your, what, what's your state of thinking there? I would probably bend myself in, a, in the skeptics camp of that. Uh, the I impact think, it can have? I think it's certainly going to have an impact on our ability to uh, curate and identify and locate high quality information mm -hmm. because it's all you and know, poor quality information right, right? The, yep, the deluge yep. of co poor quality or completely synthetic information is going to come um, I think again I am hopeful when I look back in history that you know maybe it was always supposed to be harder to accumulate high quality information than we've had it for the last 20 years We've turned it into a very a, a convenience and a commodity to have ready access to um, high quality, verifiable, transparent information. Maybe it was always folly to assume that that was durable in a hyper capitalistic uh, uh, society. And and there's something to be said for returning to a place where you had to uh, to kind of struggle to and, and wrestle with questions for longer than it took you to type it into a. A search bar um, but all in all I think um, I I don't subscribe to the idea that we can um, distill the sum of human knowledge into a, a set of, of data and have it spit out anything but um, uh, and I, I wouldn't disagree with that at because Technology changes human nature remains pretty consistent. You brought up a lot of philosophy. Maslow's hierarchy, I think, is going to, to remain pretty much in place. Maybe it'll it it'll shrink some of the the the, the, the different integers, but, but all things said and done. But if you look over time and over history, normally it's not tech superiority, but it's how it's applied. Um, all the way back to bow and arrow. Um, and and how you were able to uh, I implement that. So I do think when it comes to AI, there are certain decisions I want someone who's sworn to the Constitution to always make on behalf of the American citizen. W would you you wouldn't disagree with that? Would Not you? at all. In fact, I I we had some discussions over the last week about what is AI going to mean for uh, intelligence analysis mm -hmm. and. Um, even if an AI spit out word for a large language model spit out word for word the same, you know, memorandum mm -hmm. that a trusted colleague did, the fact that a trusted colleague spat one of those out mm -hmm. is why I trust it more. And emotion and connection and right. people. Yeah. And, and uh, I, I forgot to know you are teaching now at SAIS uh, down the street, which is a wonderful organization. And the, in the Al Perlovich uh, school, which we had Dimitrian recently. So final issue, and, and you and I have discussed this in the past. I, I, I think having contrarian views is essential in the intelligence and, and analysis uh, uh, communities. I, I mean, groupthink could be very dangerous. Are, are we at that point now? You and I may not agree on everything. I, I we we had discussed here. Quite honestly, we don't. I don't agree with myself tomorrow. So, <laughs> uh, um, but I think it is healthy and it's constructive, and we need to constantly question assumptions. I, I mean, if you look back to uh, the 9/11 Commission and 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 the attacks on 9/11. 
lots of lots of data was there, lots of information was there. Uh, the commission claimed it was a failure of imagination, which I think there's there's truth to all of that. But but on these sorts of issues, I, I mean, no question we're going to be dealing with nation states that wish us harm, that will be throwing everything at us to to try to get uh, an edge and 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 superiority. But I, I also think having divergent views, opinions, analysis, estimates is really important. Would you kind of agree with that? Absolutely. And I think as much as I think failure of, of imagination may have been a major factor in, in some uh, catastrophic strategic failures in the past, I worry that uh, inertia is, is probably going to be uh, equally uh, complicit in, in the ones that may be to come. And I, I, I think noticing that, noticing within ourselves when we can just sense that, well, this is the way the winds are blowing, this is the way that things are converging, so get on board. Um, I think particularly in a national security, uh, in spaces where national security decision making is happening, um, it's important, irrespective of administration, irrespective of the job to be at least willing to say, hey, let's pump the brakes for a minute and make sure that um, our assumptions are correct. Um, I think at, at SICE in particular, you know, we try to get the students ready to, for a world in which you've got 30 seconds to make oh, your yeah. point. But in some regard, I think that's been such a, a, a cop out um, if we want more strategic thinking out of this town, we need more than 30 seconds. We need to acknowledge that some of these things are harder than a, a, a memo size and that some of these things don't have, you know, three option answers and that some of these problems are not fixable within a matter of, of you know, two to four years. Um, and that's not a popular thing to say to a general or a national security leader. Um, but I think we need to be more honest about that and with ourselves um, because it's too easy to say, well, look, AI is the future and this is the <laughs> way things are going or this is the way we've always thought about Russia or China. And not to just be contrarian for its own sake, but I think enough people notice within themselves that, wow, we seem to all be nodding at the same time and there's a little bit of danger in that. Well say I, I mean, I look at it as an art and a science. I don't think there'll ever be a complete science for intelligence analysis, right. nor can it be purely art. But, you know, if I've known someone for 20 years, I trust their gut. Maybe they can't even articulate what it is. But that's going to be with us, I think, for a long time. And I'm really glad you brought that point up. Last question. So we have an election coming up. What should we be thinking or uh, what, what, what would you be re recommending right now? I think having faith in, um, in the folks that have worked hard for these last several years to make elections secure. I mean, you've had Chris Krebs on, Dimitri on. I mean, these are some of the, the, the best minds and the most intelligent and high integrity people that I've ever encountered in, in government or out that have really been putting their minds towards making this work. I had the opportunity to work alongside some of them um, in the IC and at the White House. Um, and for as much reason as there is to always feel that sense of precarity, we've got a lot of reason to be confident that we that these that this next election and the next election and the next election will be the most secure elections ever because we've decided to prioritize it and because we've got um, a lot of good practices and a lot of good infrastructure and a lot of trust there that simply we didn't have in, in 2016. And so there's, there's, a, there's a, a reason for optimism there. Thank you for that. And resilient, not just secure, I think, is the is the adjective I would be using. Um, Gavin, thank you for joining us today, spending so much time. Keep fighting the good fight. Keep dancing to your own beat. And until next week, stay safe, stay strong, stay curious. Thank you. Thank you.